Hi, good evening, Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to the consultation hosted by the recently appointed Cabinet Committee for the review of the SEA and Concorda, two enduring legacies of the education system. The committee comprises 18 members who represent a wide range of education stakeholders, including representatives of the Ministry of Education, the University of the West Indies, and the University of Trinidad and Tobago, national associations of public and assisted primary and secondary school principals, the National Parent Teachers, Teachers Association, the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association, and the Interreligious Organization. I am your host this evening, Lance Motley, one of the members of the committee. Over the past six months, the committee has been using a participatory evidence-based process in its review. We have spoken with various national and international experts, explored theory and case studies, consultation data and empirical data, gathering pertinent system level data on Trinidad and Tobago's education system. This data have given us greater insight into the complexities of our education system and have shown us that there is no simple single solution. Rather, multiple approaches must be considered to address the often interrelated issues. Our process allows us to carefully deliberate, compare and weigh policy options to improve the overall system as best as possible. The public engagement in the solution is important. We explore the process used as it is also important for citizens to have a deeper understanding of Trinidad and Tobago's education system, the way it impacts each of us, each child, and our nation's future. Every policy decision must consider every one of us and be made with care. So today, we would like to tap into you, the public, so you can better understand what we are doing how we are doing it, and to share your perspectives on the process. Today, I'm joined by other committee members as well as key experts in the education sector to present information on, on our policy process, to share some of the key data that have informed our policy analysis, and discuss the implications of our findings on potential policy options. We have two sessions planned for you today. Today is our first where we focus on the secondary entrance examination and our second on next week, Tuesday the 14th, shifts the discussion to the Concordat. We have two segments today, each followed by 25 minute questions and answer sessions for your discussion. Of course, those already registered and present via Zoom can utilize the question and answer feature. Those of you joining in on Facebook can utilize the comment section you're also welcome to send your questions via WhatsApp at 7760440. Don't worry, if you didn't get the number, it will be posted on the screen for your convenience throughout the program. Without further delay, we begin our conversation with three dynamic speakers. We start first with Professor Jerome Delisle, Professor of Educational Leadership and Director of the School of, the School of Education University of the West Indies Chair of the Cabinet Appointed Committee for the Review of the SEA and Concordat. Before we go to him, just also let me let you know that we do have Dr. Peter Smith, the Chief Education Officer of the Ministry of Education, and Dr. Joan Spence, Behavior Change Consultant and Lecturer, Oxford Graduate School, the Therapeutic Assessment Center. Each panelist will present for 10 minutes. At this point, I take the privilege in turning the floor over to Professor Jerome Delisle, Chair of the Cabinet Appointed Committee, to discuss the committee's policy process. Good evening to you, Professor, and welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Martin. I'm delighted to have this chance to engage with you. Um, it's something that we ha had hoped to begin much earlier, but we have been engaged in the process of looking at the evidence and looking at theory and looking at case studies. Uh, we've had the benefit, as you will realize, of consultations, which Dr. Smith will, will, will chat with us on. Let's go back to our terms of reference to get an idea of, of, of what is really necessary or what we are required to do. We are required to look at 
the transition between primary school and secondary school, that's the kids. Um, and we have set goals for ourselves, what we expect that transition to accomplish in terms of excellence, equity, and well-being. And, and the major question is, which policy options? What are we going to choose as we confront uh, the aspects like the, uh, of the concordat, like the 20 percent, um, the the fact that we have a high stakes placement, and you will see how we worked the trade offs and 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 finally come to some suggestions in terms of the policy options. Now, when you write a report like this, it's 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 meant for the public. So it has to be understandable. I mean, you, you know, I'm an academic, and I write so people don't understand, which is, I, I guess, what most academics do. But when you're writing for the public, they must understand what you're saying. They must be engaged with the process if they are to be empowered. We looked at the past Caribbean reports. You must always know where you're coming from. Um, the the Shari report, I'm, I'm going to call it by the chairman, don't call this report anything by my name. Um, it's an excellent report. Uh, 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 Professor Shari died in 2017. Um, that was such an excellent report. Um, Dr. Brooms from CXC actually did a, a secondary um, uh, evidence part. Um, our evidence is, of course, integrated into the report. And, of course, we all know the 1998 task force report on the removal of the common entrance, uh, which looked at uh, the particular policy option. Now, these reports were, were, were fantastic. Um, I do policy work, so it's not clear sometimes um, what, how the committee came to that conclusion. Um, we talk about things like policy argumentation that is sometimes not as elaborated as it should be. And the fact is, when you deal with the transition of, of students, um, which we inherited um, over the years from colonial times, um, you're dealing with a very complex problem with people seeing it in different ways. So we had to confront that in uh, trying to accomplish a, 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 a process. So what are our goals? Our goals was to use robust evidence, um, and, and, and you have different levels of evidence according to the hierarchy of evidence. Um, so we look for census type data, we look for systematic reviews, country studies. Um, we have to view it as a problem solving exercise. We have to, to value what the citizens, how the citizens see the problems, because the citizens are part of the, of the problem itself. So they have to understand it. They have to say, well, I am seeing this, and then move from what they're saying and, 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 and look for the evidence and come to a conclusion. We also have to review theory and, and, and policy. There's a lot of policy because the, the OECD, which is an uh, organization for some of the Western countries, um, they are very clear that an that, uh, early exam, um, when we got clear from the discussions that I've been having, it cannot measure merit. Um, it's too early, and so it picks up family background, um, and that's uh, that's 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 clear, um, including the, the countries like Germany, in, in, in which they've tried to move back the the age. So we decided to choose a, a eight-step process called uh, policy analysis, um, designed by. Professor Eugene Badak. And let's look at that process. You would see it's, uh, we adapted it a bit because um, as discussed with our former vice chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Citran, he wanted evidence to be centered. Uh, and, and, and I agreed. And so evidence is, is part of the process, um, straight through. And so we moved back from evidence, then we go to policy options, and then we go back to evidence. We look at our own values, then we go back to evidence. We look at the, the outcome. So evidence is, is is central. We know you'll get trouble looking at the evidence. It just looks like all these lines, right? But we think that uh, the data 
empower citizens to truly understand what your problem is. In our societies, uh, sometimes people hide data from us, um, but it's important for us to see data to make decisions. But apart from that, we also use other lenses. Um, for example, uh, the legal lens was very important for us because we have we had to understand, well, what does the Constitution say in 4F about parental choice? Um, then you have the philosophical lens, which looks at things like fairness. What is fairness? Um, how does that impinge upon the choices that we made? So we use these multiple lenses, which also kind of unique to our uh, decision making as well. Whatever decision we make, you know, sometimes people say, well, okay, just leave it as it is now. Um, because we, we don't trust anyone. Sometimes I say that too. Um, you have to look for the future. If you leave something as it is, if your grass grows, you say, I ain't gonna cut grass, um, things that go high must come down. <laughs> no, the grass will just grow and take over your, your whole house. So, how do you go? and look for the future. As you do that, you must look behind and see where you were. So you have to understand your past to go forward to the future. I mean, use this theory uh, by Otto Schama, which looks, which is called you theory. Wow. Never forget this is about the kids. All of us, not one kid or two kids or different types of kids, but all of us together. If we work together, we will get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Delisle, the chairman of the Cabinet Review Committee, and who gave us um, some insights as to the process that was used to get us where we are. He asked some very important questions. Um, one important question that struck me was, which policy options do we use? I assure you will have an opportunity, you will have an opportunity to interact with that question further later, a little later on in our presentation here. It is a consultation, and what is a consultation with your, without your involvement? So you will have an opportunity to pose your questions. In fact, you can do so now. We will take them a little later. You can pose your questions on the Zoom chat. Uh, you will have an opportunity for those of you who want to let your voices, your actual voices be heard. You will have that opportunity as well, and you can Pose your questions on the Facebook stream, live stream, and on WhatsApp at 7760440. Professor Delisle asked a very important question, um, a, a statement actually. You've got to know where you've come from to know where you're going. And so I thought that that was such, an, uh, such a nice statement to lay the foundation for the next speaker, Dr. Peter Smith, the Chief Education Officer of the Ministry of Education and a member of this committee. And he's going to talk about um, the process, talk about the past consultation, because as you would have known, we would have had consultations in the past and we've had one in 2020. And Dr. Smith is going to tell us about, uh, about that, provide a source of the data for the committee's deliberation. Dr. Smith, good evening to you and welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Motley, and good evening to our viewers. I will just take you briefly through the rationale for the 2020 consultation. The national consultative process is extremely important in the policy-making process in that it enables an evidence base to be built, ensures transparency in the process and gives stakeholders ownership of the eventual outcome, and that's very important. This, essential, this is essential if the ministry is to achieve its goal of quality education for all learners, and is particularly imperative in the COVID-19 era, where most persons, especially the vulnerable, and negatively affected. The objectives of the National Consultation on Education 2020 were therefore to, one, garner strategies and recommendations for treating with various issues and problems occurring in the education system. Two, inform the reform of curricular content, instructional practices, and assessment. Three, 
examine sector-based systems, processes, policies, regulations, and programs to arrive at an increased re relevance and efficiency. Four, bring into discussion the expertise, perspectives, and ideas for alternative actions and of those directly affected through increased transparency. And five, identify and find solutions for unintended effects and practical problems post COVID-19 with respect to the areas of focus of the consultations. And at this point, I'll give you a little more details in terms of the specifics for the 2020 consultations. So the National Consultation on Education 2020, Transforming Education, It Takes a Village, focused on the following areas. One, the conduct of the secondary entrance assessment and transition to secondary school. Two, the concordat. Three, curriculum reform. Four, blended learning. Five, teacher training and development. Six, the role of parents and guardians in education. And finally, the role of the Teaching Service Commission. And let me say from the onset, it has indeed been a consultation where considerable focus was placed on the collection of evidence from our various stakeholders. And if I may give you an example of a target audience, we would have collected information through focus groups, surveys, and webinars from approximately 10,000 persons. In terms of parents, over 4,000 parents would have participated in that data collection exercise. Primary and secondary school students, again, approximately 4,000. And then secondary, as well as primary educators, would have made up the remainder of persons who were sampled in the 2020 consultations. Coming out of that, there were several major recommendations, some of which were cross-cutting teams. And to give you an idea, one of the things, or a few of the things that were mentioned, one, monitor and evaluate the training provided to teachers in the new online modalities, prioritize funding for schools, inclusion of 21st century skills in the curriculum, of course, increase the quality of communication and the collaboration, develop a clear policy for the transition from primary to secondary school, and develop a more equitable education system. As it pertains to the secondary entrance assessment, the following points were noted. Give clear and cogent document on the process and outcomes of the secondary entrance assessment transfers, placement, assessment results, and the transitioning process from primary to secondary school. Secondly, Re-examine the current assessment method and curriculum to identify the areas of weaknesses. Third, provide evidence of what the test measures, the recommended uses, the intended test takers, and the strengths and limitations of the test, including the level of precision of the test scores. Finally, provide information to support recommended interpretations of the results, including the nature of the content, norms for comparison, and other technical evidence. And so, with this in mind, the committee w was able to gather evidence going forward and just 
a brief on the Concordat, one, re-examine and revise the purpose and criterion of the 20% selection, engage in discussions with the denominational boards, third, develop a strategic plan for the efficient allocation of funding, as was stated before. And then finally, develop a framework that allows principals and boards to manage their schools. And with this in mind, we are going forward as a committee at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith. You would have heard the kind of process that would have been involved in the past consultation in 2020 that would have led to a wide uh, collection of data which um, is being used actually by this present committee in, in, in its deliberations so that it's not an idle engagement at all. It is a consultation and of course um, we are eager to have you participate but before that we will take a small break and when we come back, we will have another presentation from another member of the committee, and then we'll be able to engage you. Mommy, yes? I'm scared. It's okay. Just keep your mask on and wash your hands as often as possible. Uh -huh. Remember how we practice? Mm -hmm. It will be fun to be back in school. You learn about healthy eating habits, play games to stay fit, mm -hmm. and you can even get a nutritious breakfast and lunch at lunchtime. And we'll see you later when we meet with the school nurse to discuss healthy eating options. The Ministry of Education is doing its part. Let's get our children back to school safely. Welcome back to the SEA Concordat Consultation. Now, given the work of the committee to review the SEA and Concordat, we must take into consideration how the SEA Concordat issues relate to experiences at the primary school transition point. Dr. Joan Spencer, third member of the committee to present here this evening, and who is a member of the British Psychological Society an author, author, principal, consultant at the Therapeutic Assessment Center, head of social work department at CNC Research Fellow and Oxford Scholar. And we welcome her here today uh, to discuss some of those issues. Good evening to you, Dr. Spence, and welcome again. Good evening, and thank you. Um, good evening, viewers. Um, this evening, I'll be discussing the socio-emotional issues uh, that would impact the transition. And I'm looking at four areas. Um, one, disparity with children from different socioeconomic background. And that includes the educational attainment, occupational prestige, and the other opportunities afforded to persons in society. Some of the disparity they are facing, cognitive disability. We find that students are in the classroom with other students. For instance, they may, be, they may have a learning disability and they are in the classroom with other students who function normal. Um, that, of course, would cause persons to behave in a particular way and they may be labeled as either troublemakers, um, delinquent, not functioning well in school, not recognizing there's a disability. Then we have poor health conditions. Um, of course, persons, if they don't have a proper nutrition, you find they have poor health conditions, you find that they're unable to concentrate well, they feel tired, so therefore their performance in school is not as the others would have. The third one is the lack of resources, and we have um, students who don't have the material, learning material for studying, um, whether it be books, whether it be laptops, whether it be internet access. Some students are not afforded that ability, and therefore there's disparity. All these children sit in a classroom and have to function together 
And of course, some are assessed as troublemakers because they don't function well, and that's very unfortunate. Then the second aspect I'm looking at is culture shock, acculturation, and maneuvering that new space. There's a sudden shift for that 11-year-old child. And uh, that sudden shift sometimes causes academic pressure because you're moving from a school where you have five subjects, now we have 13 subjects. We have less supervision because we know in the schools, in the primary schools, we have what, one teacher would take care of that child. Um, so every day the child looked forward to that teacher like a mother, and they would go to school. You now have the child going to school, mixing with other students, um, have different teachers for different subjects, and sometimes feel lost. As a result of that, we find that the children look to their peers for supervision, the older peers, and the older peers sometimes we find there's where peer pressure comes in because they're introduced to things like alcohol, um, exposure to drugs and alcohol, bullying, sex and cyber sex. Um, we also have cyber bullying and so on. And those are the things that they are exposed to when they enter the secondary school. In addition to this, we have children being valued and devalued based on the uniform they wear. Um, so you attend a particular school, and because the school is not the so-called prestige school, you are devalued, and that's another um, situation that the children have to face. So those things, are, they cause social anxiety, and that preludes children developing unhealthy coping mechanisms, and some of them are cutting and other behavioral problems. The third aspect I want to talk about is the transition coincides with a diverse interplay of biological, psychological, and social changes. And Eric Erickson refers to this as the industry versus inferiority. And we know for an 11-year-old child, um, if they successfully navigate this period, it's fine. But however, if they fail to, they develop some sort of inferiority. What happens when they feel that way? They seek attention. And the attention-seeking behaviors, such as poor academic um, performance, fighting, bullying, school dropouts, and so on. Those are some of the reflection of that, uh, that whole transition in terms of having to deal with the whole issue of changing, dealing with the psychological, the biological, and the social, and then having to deal with the children in the school. In addition to that, we have threats from parents during that period of time, where the ch parents will threaten the children that they have to do well and you better do good, you better pass as, as just same school as your sister or your brother. So that's comparing, and then that's uh, um, pressure, parental pressure for the children. All these are really developmentally inappropriate for an 11-year-old child. The final one I want to discuss in, is in terms of the dual roles of the teacher. And we have to remember that the teacher is not only a teacher in the classroom, particularly in the primary school, the teacher is also the mother the mentor, um, because they mother the child, that child, and that child really listens to the mother, the, to the teacher, even more than they listen to the mother sometimes. So there's a great reserve of respect for the teacher, and the teacher is under a lot of pressure. So that dual role of both mother, um, as teacher, disciplinarian, and so on, is a lot for the, the teacher. In addition to that, the teacher also has to deal with their own issues, and uh, places them under some psychological stress. Um, sometimes it affects, many times it affects their functioning as a teacher. And we suggest that teachers be assessed psychologically at the beginning of their career in teaching, and then they have continuous assessment so that they'll be able to, psychological assessment so that they'll be able to function effectively. One of the things I also want to note is that because of that transition, the number of things that happen within that transition, it is important for us to manage the transition effectively. And in doing so, we need to look at, in terms of the persons, we have to identify persons who have uh, mental issues, mental health issues, um, any sort of development or learning disabilities. We have to look at that, and we also have to look at persons who uh, come from diverse backgrounds, deprived of different um, learning materials. So 
So I just want to thank you very much for the opportunity to share this this evening. Dr. Spence, thank you very much for your brief presentation on the analysis of the social and, and emotional issues that our primary school children are, uh, face in transitioning from primary school to secondary school. One of the things that struck me, by the way, and uh, it's kind of funny, is that how, how many of us can recall at some point in time calling our teachers mommy and daddy? You know, you're, you're meant to say miss where you end up saying mommy or, or, or sir and you end up saying daddy. And, and that might be sound funny, but of course it really speaks to what you're talking about in terms of the, 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 the kind of impact that teachers have on our young charges. Well, we do have a number of questions and we want to thank you again, once again, this is a consultation and what is a consultation without your engagement? So you can send your questions via the Zoom chat. You will have an opportunity as well to speak to us directly if you so wish. You can send your comments and questions via a Facebook live stream and on WhatsApp at uh, 7760440. We do have some questions, however, some Zoom questions as well as Facebook, and we go through them as quickly as possible. So the first question. One, um, one of our viewers on Zoom has said, a couple of years ago, there was a progressive step to incorporate periodic assessments to allow the learning process to be steady throughout the education of the young child. The question is, why did we go backwards? Um, this is assuming that we did go backwards. The question is to the panel. Anyone there would like to take the question? You, 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 you heard the question. You want me to repeat it? So. Did we go backwards? There's, there's not a specific question, really. Yes. It, it, I would have appreciated it if it could have been a little more specific. I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of perhaps one CEC or secondly, the national test, which was administered at standard one and standard three um, in mathematics and English language arts. And it was stopped for a while, but at this point in time, it is being review, reviewed for reintroduction. If the person is mentioning that particular right. periodic assessment. Well, we do hope, um, uh, Zuma, that that did answer your question. We do have another question from Zoom, and this is the question. Are we going to lose the benefits gained from online learning and hybrid learning? A very good question. And I think this one is at the center of, uh, the doorstep rather, of Dr. Peter Smith. We are definitely not going to, to lose that. In fact, as many persons may or may not be aware, um, there is a move even at this point in time at the level of CXC for the introduction of e-testing. And of course, it is going to be Difficult to just simply indicate that we will just simply proceed with e-testing after your normal face-to-face. -face. So the intention is to have both that face-to-face -face as well as that online engagement and its continuance going forward. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Let me just uh, remind our viewers. So this is about SE and the Concordat. And I know there are varied issues facing our education system and we, we can get lost in a number of these issues, but we want to stay focused really on the SE and Concordat. So if you can zero in your questions in those areas so that we can get to our objectives and our goal. We do have a question here, um, and this one actually is on the SE. And this is a Facebook question. We thank you for your question. Will we Will a new framework be used for SEA since the last one was for the period 2019 to 2023? Or based on these consultations, this whole format will change? I think that that would be a direct question. Um, I was kind of hoping that Dr. Smith gets all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are very cautious in recommending changes. Um, the reason for that is the data suggests that the COVID has created a decline, or if you want to say an increase in the numbers of students performing below 50% and 30% at primary school. So the goal, I believe the administration have at this point is to recover, to stabilize, 
using hybrid or blended systems. Um, and then we can think about the, uh, those changes in the future. Now, there's a way to, to make changes. Actually, um, the, the, uh, the ministry, they have experimented with it. I'm not going to say it was my idea. But the, the new writing, um, the new rubric, it was prototyped. So before you do anything, you take it, you test it, you get information, and those teachers know they will have had an entire booklet giving ideas about how to go forward. So we're not just going to suggest a change. If something is going to happen, it has to be prototyped, and uh, it's going to occur in the future. I don't know if Dr. Smith wants to disagree with that, but that's okay. Dr. Smith, yes. No, I would definitely would not disagree with that. And as persons would be aware, you would notice that in the past, um, very often we would, we would have had the framework for perhaps eight, nine, and even 10 years. The last framework is from 2019 to 2023. The understanding is that it will be reviewed based on the data from the last several years. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. I have a question for Dr. Spence, who spoke about the social and emotional issues um, that impact upon an 11-year-old. Dr. Spence, would you say that given all that our very young primary school children would have to endure, including those that you would have outlined, do you think that the SEA, perhaps the, the kind of um, stress that the SEA, some believe that places the students on, do you think that their, their young bodies and minds can uh, really endure and should continue to endure that level of stress? That is a good question. It's quite interesting, but it's, it's um, let me see what I can tell you. The fact that students, as we spoke about the stage of development and that assessment of what it does, if they are successful, they feel okay, but if they're not successful, they feel inferior. That stage is a very difficult, um, I would say, delicate stage for this 11-year-old child. And uh, having to endure something like the SEA and go through that assessment and being Addition to this, we're talking about the public view on how they assess them and so on. So those additional stresses, it brings a lot on the child, it bears a lot. And I feel that it can be very, you know, emotional and for that child at that point. Yeah. So the answer to this que that question is ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> understand. Yeah. So we do have some more questions uh, again. Um, it's a Zoom question. What measurable changes have they... Um, let me see if I can put, have they made upon the constant discontent expressed by most stakeholders in the transition of primary to secondary education? Let me read it again. What measurable changes have they made upon the constant discontent expressed by most stakeholders in the transition of primary to secondary education? I'm not too sure if any one of you got that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in terms, and, and by the way, the yeah. they, yeah, is at, at the reviews and the consultations. That's yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. Um, the first thing is to recognize if you have a problem. And for this, uh, the Prime Minister is probably correct. The second thing is to review it with data. That's what we saw in the instance of, of Singapore. They are struggling. They've tried a number of ways to lessen the stress and anxiety of their... Uh, uh, PSLE, which is their exam at, at 12. And of course, um, they've been thinking that, uh, maybe about two years ago that they, they didn't see an alternative. Um, so at this point, what we're trying to do is to, to listen to the citizens and to, to, to seek uh, alternatives. Our system is quite different. This is not Singapore. And you will see differences um, when, when, when we look at at the data. Um, I just need to say though that we need to do the basics. So so when I <laughs> began to look at transitions, um, it suddenly occurred to me that in England that they recognize that moving from primary school 
to secondary school was stressful. Mm -hmm. And they provided guidance, support, etc. And I can't find that in my own system. So we have to do some of the basics um, first. But certainly, um, we need to consider um, the changes that must occur without creating um, turmoil. So you want to cut the grass in, in, in the yard, so you said to bring a tractor and dig everything up. So I'm moving that man, so the grass wouldn't grow again. <laughs> Not sensible. Let me ask a very direct question. So the, the mandate of this review, of this committee, is to review the SEA and Concordat. That is based on the assumption that perhaps that there is, that the, the SEA and Concordat, there's some challenge with it. Is there a problem with it? Now, again, we look at Burmese City data, but we can see high-performing systems with the same with the same policies, but they're not underperforming. So, if you look at the Netherlands, for example, uh, their system is primarily denominational schools. They have the CETO test, which Dr. Smith knows that at twelve it's, it's a very famous test. They also have a stratified system, but they are they are a high-performing uh, society. So there are other things that are absent in our system which we need to put in um, as we move along the road to transforming uh, the society. I mentioned Singapore. Singapore is um, either first or second. First um, in 2015, um, second now that um, uh, China changed some of its uh, um, um, persons involved in, in, in their scores. Um, again, both countries have uh, um, early selection. However, I need to be honest and say quite clearly that the OECD does not encourage early selection. And the number of systems having early selection at 11 or 12 or 10 to 12, that has been reduced significantly. In Germany, um, there's a constant effort to try to change that age of selection. So that's something that we need to consider, but the the effects must be clear to us and the consequences must also be clear. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, Dr. Spence would have spoken about the kind of kinds of disparities that exist among and within our education system, among our students and within the education system. Uh, this question is while, so Dr. Smith, Dr. Spence would have raise those issues, but this is a policy question, I think it is, and it's a Facebook question, so this goes to the uh, chief education officer, the CEO. What are the types, if any, of means of assessment and placement being put into place for diagnosed and suspected diagnosed students with learning and developmental challenges? So what kinds of um, assessments are being placed? Okay, so it's a, a very good question, and let me just state this from the outset. Um, currently, at the Student Support Services Division, there are assessments that are used to diagnose students with challenges. So there is a, an ongoing process, even as we speak. And just to extend a bit more, we are even looking at extending that to those students as early as age five. So there are systems in place currently to really and truly diagnose and treat with students that face challenges. Okay, thank you. Dr. Smith, don't um, leave the platform yet mm -hmm. <laughs> because this question is directed to you. This yep. is a Zoom question that has been posed to you and it says, these aims and elements all seem as abstract and idealistic as they were in the past consultative exercises vis-a-vis -vis the previous common entrance and the transition to the current SCA in 1998 to 2000. How is this committee actually streamlining these? Well, actually, this might be for you, Professor, although it says to Dr. Smith, how is this committee actually streamlining these issues to effectively move from a theoretical sounding base to real pragmatic measures that will actually be in line with realities of today? You want me to read it again? It's a very long-winded question. <laughs> you got it? Let me leave it here. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, I understand. Um, 
and of course, I think citizens must understand that people have divided views. Um, so some people are afraid of 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 of, of drastic changes, um, and some people say, "Well, just change it." Um, no one changes anything like that. The rule is in policy, when you're changing something, just as Mr. Citron pointed out, you need to look for evidence. So it, our report is fundamentally different from the 1998 report. Firstly, it's based on the consultations, the extensive consultations from the ministry. Of course, we didn't trust the ministry right away. We actually took the raw data and, uh, well, I'm not supposed to say that, I don't because it wouldn't be happy, but we reanalyze the data. We didn't trust them. We don't trust um, institutions in Trinidad. And we reanalyze the raw data. And so all the data is ours in the committee. Um, and, 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 and we, we analyze it up to the standards as if it was a research level. And then we look at the data. We don't have our ideas. And then um, say, well, on the way, when our data shows that, we, we are led, driven, um by the data um so you can be confident as you listen to this consultation that that is so um pragmatic yes we are pragmatic and we consider all policy options discussed so when you read the report if you ever see the report if you read the report you're going to see each policy option listed how we voted on it the policy argumentation behind each the trade-offs that we suggest the risk involved so you're going to see the different policy options but this continues um this morning you know i i i, I mentioned the whole issue of zoning I, i'm not saying that we are recommending zoning i'm saying that it will be discussed in a detail that you would not see before so that allows our superiors to to look at it and make the decision where they want to go but we've also crafted some pure evidence-based policy options, and we will discuss that as time, as time goes on. You know, language is very important, vocabulary as well, so that, um, you know, when people hear certain, certain words, they make assumptions. So review doesn't mean disband or continue. It just simply means review. Not so? So we're using the evidence, we're using the data that uh, were collected in the last consultation, as you said, to form our, um, to form our, or, or, or what is it? Or decision to yeah, yes, to, to arrive to, to arrive to arrive yeah. what our decision. We do have some more questions from Zoom. Um, are there any educational models from other countries that we can follow to improve our current education system? Any one of you can take that. I can perhaps take a, a shot at it. And even as we would have listened to Professor Delisle speak. Um, we would realize that he was actually referencing other countries so that we are in the process of benchmarking. Of course, we must take into consideration our peculiar circumstances. So we are looking at other systems, but as I said, we must consider what is peculiar to Trinidad and Tobago. Most certainly. Okay, so we have the questions are coming in. Once again, you can, if you do wish to have your voice, your actual voice be heard, you can zoom in um, as well and you can indicate such and our technical team will be putting you up. But you can join us uh, via Facebook as, as well. You can send your questions via Facebook and WhatsApp at 776-0440 and you can send us an email as well. And uh, that is up on your screen. So another question, uh, are there, uh, we, we, we did that already. Um, this one is from um, a name, okay. How is SEA and the education sector preparing our students for a global workforce, especially in the areas of STEM and even AI, artificial intelligence? I think that, too is another question for Dr. Smith because that speaks to policy. Okay, um, again, a very interesting question given the technological changes that are, are being made at this point in time. And let me see, when we look at 
the the SE at this point there is a focus on math and English language arts and writing. And that framework would have been developed not just simply from our own perspective, but we would have looked to see what was out there in the international arena. So for instance, Tri and Tobago would have participated in PISA, which is an international assessment. We would have participated in PULS, Progress in International Reading Literacy Study, another international assessment. And I think from those assessments, we are able to gather um, those critical skills that are needed for us out there. Um, math and language or math and reading still remain very important skills that we need to have. Of course, in the, in the review of the curriculum, we do have those areas mentioned going forward. So if one were to look at the, the concept note that we have on the website, we will see um, we will see suggestions being made to take the country in that direction. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. We do have someone live on Zoom, and we are very happy to have you. Welcome, Mr. Nish. Okay, so while we work out the technical issue as it relates to Mr. Nish, who would like to participate um, live on Zoom. We go to some other questions. Uh, are there plans to increase uh, the amount of training and guidelines for teachers to prepare students for the SEA? At this point in time, perhaps we should just have Dr. Smith. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, uh, let me add something to that issue okay. of, of, of AI and, and STEM. Right. And I think it's a good question. Yes, please go do we, ahead. Do we do we have Mr. Nish? Do we have Mr. Nish now? Okay, we still seem to be working that out. But uh, we go back to you. Yes. Yeah, uh, so Professor. we do. Just as we mentioned, we do need to see the future, and the future is not like today. You must be present in yourself to be able to move forward. And so we need to recognize that our our system. Uh, needs needs to change, but that doesn't mean, for example, that that the option is to say, well, okay, we're going to put science in the in the SEA. Um, the SEA remains a placement exam, and you don't need to have science to place. We saw in the 1996 report on placement um, that there were issues about that's the one before 1998. So it's not public; it's a it's an internal report. That there were issues in using in using the science. So again, once you once an issue is raised, we go back, we look at it. Um, the main thing for Trinidadians now, for us now, is to understand that science belongs to everybody. Uh, people think about science. Well, that means you're going to be a doctor. No, it doesn't mean you're going to be a doctor. It means that you're going to be a more efficient technician. Um, it means that you will live effectively because you know science. So science for everyone is something that we also must look at. So we have to continually engage with ourselves and don't end up using the same wine bottles and, and throwing new wine into it. Thank you very much. Um, I want to come back to the SEA and in terms of the context of uh, where the review of the SEA. And I think you would have you would have, in your early presentation, Professor Delisle would have cited um, a few countries where there are placement exams. I'm, I'm bringing this point up because of the fact that a number of us in Trinidad and Tobago may not be aware that a number of other countries, apart from countries in the Caribbean, um, that would have placement um, exams from primary school to secondary school. How is that important? How is that knowledge yeah. important to us in our review? I think that's so important. Um, it's, it's part of my growing, as you know, I've spent time just studying the uh, 11 plus alone. I, I, I was aware that Singapore um, uh, retained the, the 11 plus, um, that they were trying to reduce its effects. I was also aware in 2009 that they reformed the entire primary school system in what they call Perry. And let me go and finish that very fast by saying, 
teaching in Singapore is quite different here. Uh, you know, people tell you that, well, um, you know, some children, they don't need to see it, you know, they're just learning. Everybody gets a chance to feel, to touch, to learn, as in your math. So I'll stop it there and we'll bring that up later. Well, a follow-up question to that would be um, the kinds of challenges that we seem to be having here in Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to the SEA and the transition process. Um, in your line of study, would you have encountered those similar kinds of challenges in other parts of the world where you have an 11 plus placement exam? Yeah, okay. Well, there's a big issue because uh, in, in, in Germany, because of course they select through uh, a judgment of the teacher at 10. Um, so they have a very early selection. Now what they found, they have three uh, tiers of schools, the gymnasium, the Hapti school, the real school. And they're realizing that in the lowest tier, that's where all the immigrants ended up. And so it was distorting the system, just as we see today, where you have poverty concentration. And they have been trying since uh, 2000 to change a the system. They've experimented, they've collected data. So for us to move forward, we must be a society like that. We must study our problems, we must collect data, we must try things, we must evaluate it. Hopefully we will reach there. Thank you very much. You are viewing uh, the first of two national consultations on the SEA Concordat. You have been very engaging and participatory. We thank you for that. We must, at this point in time, take a break. But when we come back, we have more. Mommy, yes? I'm scared. It's okay. Just keep your mask on and wash your hands as often as possible. Uh Remember how we practice? Mm -hmm. It will be fun to be back in school. You learn about that's healthy good, eating good. habits, play games to stay fit, mm -hmm. and you can even get a nutritious breakfast oh, no, no, no. and lunch at lunch. And we'll see you later when we meet with the school nurse to discuss healthy eating options. The Ministry of Education is doing its part. Let's get our children back to school safely. Sorry? Yeah, but that's a lot of questions. Welcome back to our consultation, the first of two on the SEA and Concordat. We have had a very lively discussion in uh, our previous segment. We now move into our second segment of today's consultation, and we want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Spence, who would have left the panel, and we would like now to welcome an addition to our panel, uh, Dr. Ruby Allen, who is the Vice President, Quality Assurance and Institutional Effectiveness, University of uh, Trinidad and Tobago. We also have someone else joining us on the panel, actually, and that is uh, Mr. Anthony Rochford. And he's joining us uh, live from Tobago. And he's a school supervisor to acting from the Division of Education Research and uh, Technology Tobago House of Assembly. So these are the two new additions to our panel. We ha have retained Professor Delisle and Dr. Peter Smith. So at this point in time, I would like to uh, welcome, uh, say welcome to our newcomers. And without further ado, I turn the mic over to Dr. Allen, uh, the Vice President, Quality Assurance and Institutional Effectiveness, UTT, and she will be speaking to us about system goals and philosophy. Good evening to you, uh, Dr. Allen, and thank you so much for joining us. I, I should also say that Dr. Allen is another member of the uh, committee. Please put your microphone on. Good evening, Mr. Motley. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about system goals. A while ago, Dr. Delisle would have said that it's all about the children. And... 
as a committee, we've had to keep our focus on that. Um, so what we really want to look at now is what goals do we have for education? What are we trying to achieve for our children? What do we want for our children in terms of the education system? And we've been guided by three goals in terms of the deliberations of the committee, um, looking at achieving equity, ensuring that all students will have an opportunity, an equal opportunity to succeed, looking at the well-being of our students. And this is a holistic view of well-being, not just looking at them um, being academically prepared for the lives, but looking at the development of the human person, looking at them physically, looking at mental well-being, emotional well-being, and addressing as well those who have special needs. And we also look at excellence. And excellence here has to be discussed in the context of what is excellent education and what is high quality education. So there are three main questions that emerge when we talk about the goals of the system. What are we educating for? What does it mean to be an educated person? And what is high quality education? And we may think we know the answers to all of those things. And actually, we do, because we find that children are often asked very early on as they're approaching the SCA exam, what school do you want to pass for? And parents are asked, what school do you want to choose for your child? And their options and their first choices and second choices and their no choices. And so we are, as a society, driven by an understanding already of what we want out of the education system and what it means for a child to be an educated person and what we consider to be high quality education. We may not have defined it, but we understand it. So I've looked at the research coming out of conceptions of excellence in education, having done my own research many years ago as well here at UE on it. And four basic conceptions emerged that I want us to look at very quickly. One is that education, excellence in education is all about intellectual supremacy. It's about being academically prepared to carry out specific functions in society, and it's driven by the focus on knowledge, understanding, the development of skills, and in a highly competitive environment as well, because everybody wants to excel, and that excelling as an individual may mean surpassing others around you. So we know that traditionally people would also ask what you came and test, and who you beat, or did you beat anybody? And so that competition has been there driving our education and our understanding of education um, traditionally as well. So that's the intellectual supremacy focus on the academic development of the child. But we also have a conception of excellence that looks at the development of character. And here we are not replacing the academic focus, but adding to it. So as we look at these conceptions, it's a progression. It starts with the academic base, but there are things that you should focus on in addition to that. And so this one focuses on ethics and integrity and moral strength and the development of the character. And in here, we would expect to find, for example, that people would understand and appreciate nonviolent behavior and the importance of choosing nonviolent behavior as a resolution for conflict. So character development takes it a little further. Then we look at self-actualization. Excellence as that holistic development of the human being intellectually, morally, emotionally, spiritually, so that the person has an opportunity to use their innate abilities and talents and creativity and to develop to a state where they feel fulfilled and uh, um, they feel that they have reached their potential. Um, but it has to accommodate all facets of human well-being and all facets of human ability. So if it is that you will excel in physical education um, as an athlete, that should be accommodated that's the excellence you're pursuing. If you want to pursue the technical and vocational education, 
then it allows you that as well. And so you have options in terms of your development. And the final conception that we want to look at is that excellence as social consciousness. This is where we get people who engage in community work, social advocacy, people who are concerned not just about the individual and themselves and their own well-being, but the well-being of the society, of the com communities in which they live, also being able to influence other persons to try to transform their reality, to make their communities better, to make life and living better, and also to make the um, environment a healthier one. So in a nutshell, if we're to talk about quality education, it can't just be about intellectual supremacy. It has to focus on the development of the character. It has to focus on the human being um, being a complete, well-developed individual. And it has to focus on that social consciousness and that ability to impact the society. So when we talk about what we want out of the education system, which influences what we teach, how we teach, how we prepare teachers for um, the classroom, how we assess students, what we assess, what kind of physical environment we want for students as well, then we have to consider what we want out of the education system, what we consider to be a good education, and who we consider to be an educated person. And kind of in wrapping up, I wanted us to look at some of these qualities of a person and determine to what extent this is an educated person if you put them all together. Because if you have someone who is intelligent, intelligent and self-centered, intelligent and dishonest, intelligent and greedy, is that our understanding of education? Is that our understanding of an educated person? Or is it that you can be intelligent but dishonest, intelligent but greedy, intelligent but unethical? So these are all values. These are all values that we transmit to our children and they're all values that we need to consider in terms of what we want in society as a good education and also how we want to shape the education system so that we provide a good education for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arlene. Very sobering, very uh, you know, engaging questions that will cause us to reflect on our own selves and our own philosophy and perhaps maybe the, the, the philosophy of education in Trinidad and Tobago. What is our perspective? Policy philosophy as well for Dr. Smith, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> Um, some buzzwords, some key words, equity and well-being, self-actualization, excellence. What does that really mean? And of course, you would have defined that quite clearly for us. We do have another um, presentation. And this time, as I mentioned before, uh, this presentation is coming out from Doc Tobago, uh, Mr. Anthony Rochford. He will be joining us virtually. He is the school supervisor to Acton from the Division of Education, Research and Technology to Tobago House of Assembly. And he's here to speak with us today about the policy trajectory of the SEA and Concordat. Mr. Rochford, good evening and welcome. Good evening, Lance, and good evening, colleagues at, at the head table, and good evening, Trinidad and Tobago. Just let me share my screen. If the host would grant me permission to share my screen. Mr. Motley, I need, I need. Um... So we are, work we are working on that. We are working yeah. on that at the moment. Um, so uh, Mr. Rochford is joining us via Zoom. And for those of us, um, if you just woke up, well, <laughs> Zoom is one of the platforms that we've been using recently to um, quite engage in a number of um, number of areas, including um, teaching, teaching, learning. Do we have it now? No, we, do we have it now? Right, we do have it now. Um, Mr. Rochford, could you try again? 
No? Yes, we are there. Yeah, got it? Wonderful. It's a good evening again. And um, my duty is just to take us through, um, as a member of the committee, this idea of the policy trajectory of the SEA and the, the Concordat. So, so I begin with the context. Um, and as we would recognize, um, the screen is not uh, moving, but um, we'll try that again. So we're dealing with the context of the Concordat. And as such, um, the year is 1960. Um, it's one year before uh, the general election in 1961. We have the emergence of a new political entity led by then Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Eric Williams. And we have the hegemony of the Catholic Church in charge of, of, of education during that period. And we have the ideas of reform in education coming up and coming forward. And so it's a very um, turbulent time and the government of the day wanted to expand the opportunity for the population. And so the idea of increasing places and spaces in education arose. And you had a slogan coming out of that. That slogan was secondary education for all, emancipate, educate to emancipate. And there we had the birth of the Concordat. That document, the Concordat of which we speak, was presented as a win-win um, situation. So that the government of the day could have an opportunity, first of all, of winning the election in 1961, but more so of having an understanding, an agreement with the then churches who administered education, um, giving them the, uh, the assurance, the guarantee that things will not change. They will be allowed to continue um, their hegemony in terms of education, but the government would also have an opportunity to provide for the wider population. Next slide, please, thank you. So we have, of course, um, the idea of the Concordat education plans and policies. And during the period 1962 to present, 1962 being the year that we had uh, independence, um, to present, there has been a number of education plans and policies throughout that period. So we, we would begin with the Morris Education Plan. And we can move through that trajectory. Uh, it would take us um, to the white paper of 1993 to 2002. And in the white paper, um, there were some workable solutions for the transition from primary to secondary school. Uh, but there was no attempt to address the challenges that arose 
um, with the Concordat. We move from the from from 1993. Uh, we, we go into an internal report on um, the placement in terms of the common entrance examination in 1996. Then we had the task force um, established to examine the removal of the common entrance examination. Because as we all are aware, during that period, particularly uh, when results would be coming out, there would be a significant amount of discussion surrounding the challenges that, this, that children were facing, families were facing, the pressures, et cetera. And we moved through that period um, into 1999, where the government of the day established a joint committee to review the Concordat and to review the impact that that would have had in terms of the transition um, and our children moving into, into secondary school. Um, that, out of that review, there were a number of uh, suggestions which this committee looked at and we took into consideration as we seek to develop a, a policy framework to treat with the SA um, and the Concordat. We continue to move along the trajectory um, right through to 2008, uh, where a memorandum of understanding was signed by the denominational boards and the Ministry of Education, um, which gave a guarantee. Uh, the then Minister of Education, um, is Cecil Manning, spoke about it in Parliament, where she would have indicated that there would not be any change, um, except that the government recognized the need to uh, assist uh, in, in terms of the funding a little differently. And the government took on board at that time, 100% um, um, funding for, for school repairs and, and so on. And you take us to our present context um, where we are now dealing with the SEA. And every time we have the results coming up, we would have that discussion and the, and, and the, the, the unease of parents and members of the public as to how does the Concordat work? Um, and so those are some of the concerns that we at the committee level um, are, are examining. And we continue. There are historical precedents and trends. So we have um, the guaranteed right of the church and the boards to control their schools coming out of the Concordat. The boards are allowed to continue to own their property. Um, schools have um, the right to select teachers of their own faith. And then we have the famous 20% school places it's allocated to the denominational de boards. And uh, question marks continue to surround this particular um, idea, uh, which we will continue to examine. We do have an 80% allocation of places um, to the state. The state taking 100% of school repair costs um, in terms of all the denominational schools. Um, the denominational boards attempted to have enshrined in the Concordat in 1999, between 1999 and 2001, to have the Concordat enshrined into the Education Act, because there's always suspicion by the denominational boards that the government, the state, is trying to undermine the authority as it relates to the administering of education um, in their schools. Um, and then, of course, you had that joint committee appointed by cabinet to examine that relationship in, in, in 1999. But during that period, there would not have been any significant uh, change or any significant examination or result coming out of, of, of um, all of those concerns. So we are hoping that on this occasion um, that we can really engage in even a deeper look at the Concordat and its impact 
um, on the SEA and together as a society, as a community, come up with what we think um, would be the best policy as it relates to that. And we can move on. There's some issues that we need to consider. And these issues include the Memorandum of Understanding that was signed by the denominational boards and the government in 2008. Um, the ruling in the Kamal Jagasa case, which seems to place the Concordat as a fundamental right, as um, a settled practice. Um, it's, it's very significant that in moving forward, we consider that, that issue. Um, the questions of, does the Concordat promote inequity or discrimination? Yay or nay? We don't know, but we need, to, we need to look at that. We need to look at what the data is telling us um, and how we would address um, those concerns. The administrative law decisions in the context of the exercise of powers. Um, that's a, a legal uh, um, term where because of what has happened in that uh, Jagasa ruling, um, we need to look at uh, the concordat in that legal context um, because that ruling was not um, appealed and therefore it, 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 it's case law. So in going forward, that has to be considered. Um, the relevance of the, of the 1960 concordat in today's context, um, how relevant is the document as it was written in 1960? and signed on the 22nd of December, um, 1960 by then Minister of Education um, and published on Christmas day. Yeah, always intrigue surrounding, surrounding the Concordat. Um, and finally, uh, do we seek to negotiate, to renegotiate the Concordat? Um, is, that, is that a possibility? How should we approach it? Um, um, you know, the committee would need to look at that and how, how, does, how would all of those issues that would I, I would have shared with you earlier impact upon this, this particular committee? What we need to look at is to explore all the historical quantitative and qualitative data. And we're in the process of doing that. We've looked at, at, at what people have been saying. We've looked at the impact. We've looked at what um, the data is saying to us in terms of the, of the 20%. Um, we've looked at this, the, this, the schools and how they perform. Uh, government schools against the denominational schools, um, the smaller schools against the larger schools. Um, we need to, to continue to uh, you know, assemble the evidence to seek the public's input, as what we are doing now, to define the problem and redefine it as, as the data, as we continue to gather that data and the evidence to construct those policy options, apply the relevant criteria, look at what those, the, 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 you know, the outcomes can be, um, um, negotiate a single you know, option going forward and, and, and then present to our principals the, the, our findings and see what decision um, that they would make. So in essence, that's the direction we need to go. Um, and that's what the committee um, is seeking to do. And we are seeking your input as the public uh, as, we, as we examine this very contentious relationship between the 1960 Concordat um, and, and the SEA. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rochford, for situating uh, the Concordat in the historical context from as early in the early days of 1960 to now, and of the emerging questions, of course, you know, is it still relevant today as it was perhaps in 1960 and what perhaps, if any, changes need to be made as it relates to the concordat but these are questions that we are attempting to to answer with your input of course you can join us live on facebook you can send your questions there you can send your questions on zoom as well uh, you can join us in audio on zoom if you so wish you can send your questions via whatsap at 7760440 and you can of course email us as well but before that we do have some questions and we do have a live Zoomer, but before that, we are going to take a very short break. And when we come back, we will take our first Zoomer and we get back into the discussions.
Mommy, yes? I'm scared. It's okay. Just keep your mask on and wash your hands as often as possible. Uh -huh. Remember how we practice? Mm -hmm. It will be fun to be back in school. You learn about healthy eating habits, play games to stay fit, mm -hmm. and you can even get a nutritious breakfast and lunch at lunchtime. And we'll see you later when we meet with the school nurse to discuss healthy eating options. The Ministry of Education is doing its part. Let's get our children back to school safely. Welcome back to uh, our first of two national consultations on the SEA and Concordat. We have had a very lively discussion thus far and you have been participating. And I did say that we were going to get into some of your questions at this time. But in fact, at this point in time, we need to continue with the conversation because we do have um, some time limits. And uh, so I want to turn the microphone over to Professor Jerome Delisle, the chair of the cabinet appointed committee and, and Dr. Peter Smith, the chief education officer of the Ministry of Education, both of whom are current members of the cabinet appointed review committee for the SEA and Concordat. So I turn you over now to Professor Delisle and Dr. Peter Smith, again. All right, so we're back again. Um, this is a little difficult session. Um, they told me not to do it, but of course we want to share our data with you. So it's a lot of graphs and things like that, but we have confidence that you would uh, understand it as we try to explain it to you, and it will empower you to uh, share with us in your many discussions. Um, so just bear with us. Let's go straight to our slides. Um, and the first thing that we want to consider is how does trend we go compare to world-class systems. Now, that graph, if you look very closely, I have to take off my glasses, just as you are probably doing right now to see um, clearly. The, the little bubbles um, represent uh, the score in uh, science in 2015 in PISA, science was measured. Um, that's science for everybody. Um, and so this, the, the, the score is represented there. Um, all of these systems are distinguished by two factors. Either they have a early selection, that is uh, even either test-based selection or they just say which students go where, or they have no selection system at all. The light blue bar, I hope you see the light blue, that represents uh, the difference between the schools and how much socioeconomic status explains the difference between the schools. Now, I know we think sometimes that in terms of the secondary schools, what explains, what explains the difference is ability. It's probably not at that age. It's likely SES. But now, as we go into the countries, we realize that uh, uh, Trinidad stands unique. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Smith? Well, I would probably like to ask, when you say SES, exactly what are you referring to? Yes, well, um, we, 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 uh, socioeconomic status is a variable, um, and it represents the, 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 not only the family background, but also the community and the household in which the person is. It, it picks up economic and social disadvantage. And this figure here is actually the average SES in the schools. So in fact, what, what we find in the secondary schools is that uh, as you move through the schools, you have a difference in the average socioeconomic status. In other words, some schools you have uh, students from a well-to-do background, and in other schools you have students from a, a challenging background. 
Okay, thank you very much. So for those persons who would have asked earlier about how Trinidad Tobago compares with other systems, this graph would definitely give you that sort of information. And just for added reference, PISA is an assessment that is administered to 15-year-olds, and it's more aligned to the world of work that those students would eventually enter. So we have comparative data for Trinidad Tobago in terms of how we perform against those other countries. Yeah. I think that the first thing that is clear is that our performance is lower than those other countries. That's the first thing. But that light blue bar means that there's a sharp difference between our secondary schools in terms of the average socioeconomic status. What it means is that when you go to the lower tier schools, the lower tier schools are concentrating poverty. Just like in Germany, um, and that is a problem. That, that is a problem? Yes, because I, I believe what happens there is that the access to resources is limited. So it does impact our students. Yeah. Of course, you know, sometimes you compare yourself to Finland. You can't compare yourself to Finland at all. All these, these schools are very, very similar in terms of uh, socioeconomic status. Hong Kong, they removed, by the way, they removed. They've been trying to remove their exam um, at early selection, and they have. And you see, again, um, uh, 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 much, much less. So, uh, uh, of course, you will see this graph later, but we could move on to another graph. And, and, and let me tell you the story behind this graph. Um, what about poor children who are bright? Um, do they get a chance um, through our placement system to maybe go into uh, a, a, a high-tier school and do well? Well, the, well, that's yellow, right? The orange bar indicates the percentage of resilient students. That is, the percentage of students from difficult backgrounds who are performing well. And immediately you realize that that figure is low in Trinidad and Tobago. So once you're poor in the Trinidad and Tobago system, you're in trouble. If you're in Hong Kong, it's a little better. But I had to say it so you can understand, right? Um, don't hold me on that. Um, once in Hong Kong, it's a little better. And even in Singapore, there's more resilience. I, I, I think that's an interesting finding. Yeah, yeah. And, and perhaps what happens there is that those countries would put systems in place to ensure that that disparity doesn't carry over too much into the education system. Yeah. One of the concerns, and I know that uh, Dr. Smith shares this concern too, is we want everybody to at least pass what I will call basic proficiency. And so we know what that level is in terms of PISA. 46% of the students in Trinidad Tobago are below level two, compared with 19 in, in Norway, 19 in the Netherlands, all with similar systems. Well, Netherlands is very similar to ours. Um, and a, a system can't go with so many students um, not reaching the basic level at 15. Agreed. And what happens is that that eventually impacts even on employment and the, and the quality of skills that you would see in the labor force at a later point in time. Yeah. Um, I like how Dr. Smith puts that because it means that you're going to have to pay to um, well, you know, we like that word remediate, but you're going to be re remediating at 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 24, 33. You're remediating. Um, so let's look at some of the graphs. Um, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, this is a comparison between the countries in, in Latin America. Now we look at some of the Western countries. But in Latin America, we okay, but we're not the best in Latin America and the Caribbean. Chile is above us, um, way above us. Um, they, they are trying a number of things, including what Dr. Smith talked about, compensatory education. They have um, all 
choice vouchers. They 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 continually try away because they really want their system to improve. Um, Uruguay as well. So we we only have data from two points. So we had to kind of work out where we would be. Uh, we likely not there, but certainly um, we we would have to to do a little better than um, um, Chile. You you. Do you know the Chile system, Dr. Smith? Not that much, not that much, Professor. Yeah. Um, I, 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 these days, when I learn about turnaround, I have to go to, to, to Chile. Of course, I, 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 I know the U.S. literature quite well, but they've been doing some excellent work with um, turnaround. There's a man there called Belay, not Delay, Belay. Um, let's, let's, let's go on. We could skip some, some. Um, uh, maybe this is important. Um, this was from 2009, if I believe, and uh, the the difference in reading uh, between the schools it's very very large. It's 96 percent in Trinidad and Tobago. Again, so so something is happening that causes that disparity between the schools. What? you think that might be in terms of reading? Because that's so essential. One of the things we would have seen um, coming out of some earlier data in terms of PEARLS, which is administered at standard three, as I indicated earlier, when we look at the background factors, one of the things that we saw would have been those students would have attended ECCE centers, generally tend to have higher scores than those students who did not. Again perhaps underscoring possibly the importance of that early education that takes place between ages three to five. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, maybe the devil just got into my mind. Are some students being left behind rather than attended to at an early age? I'm sorry to ask you that, but... Well, I, I, again... The possibility does exist um, when you look at our education system. Perhaps what happens when students enter school, sometimes as teachers we may have certain expectations that those students should be at a certain level. And so when that expectation is not met, some, and I must say the majority of teachers, do put things in place to address those um, shortcomings. However, it may not be across the board as one would expect. I think that's a good, um, excellent political um, hit for six there. Um, let's go to the, the other graph and I, I will just speed up on that because you can't have 42%. Look at the bottom. Um, the orange is the, is, the, is the level at which we, we call basic proficiency. And look at the gray areas. That's students who are not reading at the basic proficiency. You can't have can't have forty two percent of students at fifteen. That that's that's uncomfortable. All right. You get a hundred million scholarships, but you can't have that because you're gonna you're gonna pay for it. Uh, just saying that. Let's go on to to, to some local data. We uh, really extract a, a lot of local data. We're very, very grateful to the um, director of DRE, Mr. Samvucharan, and uh, uh, we worked with him hard to collect some of this data, and the UV staff, uh, Ms. Lucas, uh, tried to present this data in a way that we could understand. Um, in terms of school choices, um, about how many students get their the first choice uh, in, in, in terms of placement? If you have an average of, let's say, 19,000 writing each year, 20%, um, you're looking perhaps about 3,800 students. Yeah, so that's, that's a, a, a good answer. A few have to reset, but um, at least 20% um, of the students are, are, are assigned by the ministry. More data. I hope I'm not confusing you with all these colors. Um, and we do we, we, we did a method called drill down. So this is summary data, but we can also show you the data for five years. 
all right? Um, so we actually track for the five years the particular data. So we never take a year because a year will give you one point. We now always take five years to see a trend, and we hope that that will give us uh, better results in terms of the placement data. Let's move on. Now, we don't normally divide the secondary schools into the denominational and, 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 and government. We use models. And we call, we, we talk about a traditional model, which would be what we call the prestige schools. Um, we talk about the modern secondary, which were, uh, was a model of school like um, uh, St. Francois, uh, um, Coover East that was built according to the Maurice Hamilton plan. Then you have the new sector schools, which were built in 1970. Um, and then we have the SEM schools, which were built with that loan from 1999. Now they include both the nominational schools as well as uh, uh, state schools. I want to mention that there has been some difference over time with the, the, the nominational, uh, new denominational schools in SEM. Doing but, quite well. But before you proceed, yes, Professor, yes. why would you, why the option to look at the, the four different models as opposed to what we are accustomed to the government assisted and government yes. secondary schools? Um, well, because um, the, the, even if you look at denominational schools, the new denominational schools are different to the traditional denominational schools, so there's a difference there. Um, if, you, if you also look at the government schools, um, Tinapuna government is not the same as even a, 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 a very good new sector school like St. Augustine. So, so it, 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 by you, if, you, if you group the schools in the national government, it tends to hide data as to what is happening. Yeah. Um, I've seen the data before, so we were able to work that out. And we're pretty confident that um, it, it, it actually works. So let's look at that. Uh, division. The first thing that we're going to look at uh, what what schools do people choose? Well, as I mentioned, they all choose the traditional plus, right? Mm -hmm. And the only government school there is uh, KRC. Ten thousand people put it for first choice. Wow. You know what I was impressed by with this data. The fact that uh, people value the modern secondary schools, right? That's the, like the Tenapuna and the Woodbrook Coover. and the Coover. Oh, Coover is yeah. doing quite well. I'm so proud of them. Yeah, that's quite, quite excellent. So that's something that we need to, to, to look at. If you look at uh, the other graph now, you can actually see an interesting school. It's a I, I, we can't classify it well because it's technically a SEM school, technically it's denominational, technically the state is involved, technically the private sector is involved um, as, as well. That's Bishop Anthony Girls High and Trinity College East, um, and 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 they they are doing well in marketing themselves, and 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 they're quite popular. If you look at the individual schools, they're very very popular. Um, so that's that's quite good too. Um, it's interesting that uh, a school like QRC is 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 um, has such um, strong choices as well. Um, although we work out that you, you know, in terms of the bright students, they tend to restrict their choices only to the traditional plus. Okay, so I know we're going fast, and it's just looking like lots of lines. You will like this data. It took us a long time to to create this data. Now, one way in which we could assess a system like ours is to look at uh, five O levels with English and math. Uh, and you want to, 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 to interpret this first because we've talked about this a lot, Dr. Smith, over the years. Right. So what we are seeing there would be the percentage of students um, achieving five or more, well, five subjects which includes math and English language art at the CSEC level. And then we have it at the various types of schools, your traditional plus. Um, you have the, the, if you go to the lower part of the graph, you have the average percentage at T in five or more, and then the average percentage in blue at T in full certificate. 
and you would see the traditional plus, it's 86 and 88 percent. Then to your modern sec, which we saw was a very popular choice, 57 and 65. Interestingly, our private schools, 46 and 58. All schools, when we aggregate it, you're looking at 46 and 52 percent. And then we use SEM schools and your new sector schools. And very often, on a yearly basis, a key indicator for our system would be that those percentages for the old schools that we would look at. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a good figure of, um, compared to the other um, Caribbean islands. Um, today, when I was on Freedom, um, you, you know, uh, so somebody said, well, you know, we've come to destroy your schools, um, to destroy some schools. Of course, nobody would destroy a school that is uh, doing 86 percent. Um, that, that's like digging up your old yard to cut down your grass. So, so that was never our plans, never our intention. You can't make policy out of uh, out of evil or out of spite. You make policy to improve a system, and to improve a system, we all go forward together. All right. So, I know your head burning. So, let's just take the more important ones. Um, I want to show you this. I just like this. Um, we track how schools. We wanted to know if the community, the public, was aware when schools were improving. Um, and if you look at the graph with uh, first choice trends of modern secondary schools, first choice trends of modern secondary schools. The public have, I don't know, have a pipeline into when they know when school's doing well. Or maybe it's, as Dr. Allen said quite excellently, it may be because those schools offer uh, the education that they value. You see how, how well Coover, East and St. George mm -hmm. is in terms of choices? Mm -hmm. Students, uh, parents are just recognizing that. Way high. And that taught us a lesson that maybe we could spend a little more time with with uh, with, with, with these schools. Um, but you see how we're thinking and we're looking at the data. Um, in, in, in this case, we didn't want a trend for five years. We wanted a trend from 2014. So we went back. Do people know what's happening? Is it changing? So schools can, can change. Oh, there's one more in the new sector school. Look at that. What's happening down in Rio Claro? That's a new sector school. King in Rio Claro. And yeah, I've looked at the papers and see that they've been doing well as, as, as well. Yes, yeah. they've been yeah. really doing well. So it means the public is aware of that. All right, some things of concern. Let's go to five. Uh, we've had, we, we have value-added data as well, but we're going to skip that and go straight on to five. Um, it's not all about the secondary school. It's about the, 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 the primary school. I know that's very important to you, Dr. Smith, yes. um, and, and, and both of us, along with Mervyn and um, Mr. Citran, we spent time trying to, to improve there. What, what happened in the pandemic? Mm. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the quality of learning, um, there was definitely an attempt to continue the education, but I suspect with the online modality, some students did have challenges. And one of the things we did see, because we did run a couple of surveys, and I think two of the issues that came up would have been one, students were distracted very often during that the instructional period, as well as the fact that they were unsupervised. So we did have some learning loss, unfortunately, during that period. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, we, and of course, uh, I know Dr. Smith Valley is my friend, however, we don't always trust the ministry. So we, <laughs> don't tell him I said that. Um, <laughs> We, we looked at two points, the 30% and the 50%. I think that's important because that's about half, right? Um, and, 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 and that was a little frightening to me because it means, what, 47% below 50? 
in 2021 dr smith that's a concern right yeah definitely Def it's definitely a concern yeah yeah of course yeah. the report has additional data and we actually examine one year in terms of marks and, and things like that. i think that that's enough graphs to hurt your head with but um i hope that you had a, oh no there's one that came out um it came out i can't tell you where it came out from but to show you you know it's not pragmatic we listened to what you said in the consultations we tracked it we got the data then we made a decision six so we know people were concerned for some reason or one or two schools about the 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 20 percent and um how these students are formed and this graph over five years shows you that the mean score of the 20 percent is much lower than the mean score of the 80 percent right don't look at the schools it's too fine you'll <laughs> hurt your eyes um so that gap means that there's a difference and so that was one of the policy options um that we looked at that 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 needed to be addressed it needed to be monitored um, but that came out of the consultation. We saw it. We read it. We see how many times pe people say that. Uh, we look at the surveys. We're doing over a survey to mention. So um, we want you to engage in that survey that is is coming. Um, any points that you want to to raise, Dr. Smith? Not at this time. J just in the key that um, the graph before where we saw the percentage of students below fifty is indeed a, a cause for concern. And it means that we need to put some sound and serious measures in place to address those those learning loss, that, that those learning gaps that we are seeing. Thank you. Back to you, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter Smith and Professor Delisle, for engaging us with this uh, lots and lots of statistical data. I really do hope that our viewers were able to sift through the many graphs and understand exactly what was being presented to them. Uh, but at this point in time, um, we must take a break. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we will be able to interact with what you would have just presented as well as uh, Dr. Allen who would have presented earlier. We do have a number of questions um, from our various platforms, so we're going to take that as well. So we take a short break. <laughs> Hey T, what's up? I had a boss day today. You saw drama today? Nah, tomorrow. Today was visual arts. My mom had to come into school this afternoon. Your mom? Yes, we had a workshop with our school nurse on healthcare and eating properly. Oh yeah, mom and dad came in yesterday for a workshop on how to manage anxiety and stress. I wonder if they could help us with the stress of this mask. And the PA <laughs> sister would be reminding me, students wash all their hands. The <laughs> Ministry of Education is doing its part. Let's get our children back to school safely. Welcome back to a live consultation on the SEA and Concordat. This is the first of two consultations. The other consultation we have next week, uh, Tuesday, that's the 14th. Be sure to join us then. This evening's consultation focused primarily on the SEA. We did have some input from the, the about the Concordat as well. Uh, but we do have an opportunity now. I know that you have been following us and that you have been eager to um, get in on the conversation. So we have decided at this time to allocate some 30 minutes to you, you our viewers, so that you can actively engage with our panelists. So at this point in time, um, let me welcome our first Zoomer. I hope we do have our first Zoomer online still. Um, do we? Uh, Mrs. Charlene Kwamina um, on Zoom. Welcome. Well, while we, while we sort that out, while we sort that out, 
let's take a, a, a question from Zoom as well. Are there plans to increase the amount of training and guidelines for teachers to prepare their students for the SEA? Dr. Smith. Okay, let me, let me perhaps state from the outset, when we introduced the 2019 to 2023 framework, I know for a fact that officers from the Division of Educational Research and Evaluation, as well as the Curriculum Planning and Development Division, did extensive workshops throughout Trinidad and Tobago, um, exposing teachers of standard five, four, and even three to that framework. And what we had actually done, we had piloted the, the first sample of that test, and we had the item analysis, and we used those results to really inform the training. So in going forward, a similar procedure will be used. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith. I want to engage both of you uh, because you presented um, just last. That's Professor Delisle and uh, Dr. Smith. I want to ask you about some uh, emerging details that came out of your last presentation. You talked about the PISA. We understand what that is. How does Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm not too sure if you have the statistics, um, how does Trinidad and Tobago uh, match up with the rest of the PISA uh, participating wo uh, world in terms of reading? Now, I know you would have segmented it in terms of age, but do we have an overall um, statement that we can say Trinidad and Tobago is this compared to the rest of the world as it relates to reading? Okay. So, so, so I can answer that. Um, most non-OECD countries, that is the European and the the, the, the and the United States and Canada. Um, most non-OECD countries, that's the countries outside of that group, tend to perform um, below um, those world standards. Um, Trinidad and Tobago struggles. Uh, 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 of course, uh, Dr. Smith has actually um, um, been when the ministry has engaged in PISA and PIL, so he will just comment on that in a short while. Um, so it's 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 below. Um, there was a hope that we will improve over the years that we have engaged in the process. Um, we haven't um, improved to, to that degree. One of the issues is the difference in reading between boys and girls, and that's very 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 sharp, um, very large between um, for for the kids at, at 15. That gap between boys and girls is probably two years. So we don't know why, but that has to be explained. Now the gap was de decreasing a bit uh, in, in, in the earlier age at, at, at for third or fourth standard, Dr. Smith? Yeah, at the standard three or grade four, um, the gap was actually decreasing. Um, and I think where we saw a decrease also would have been when we come to the different types of reading passages. So PULS examines both informational passages as well as, as well as fictional passages. And we did see a decrease in that gap. Okay, and a follow-up question to that, and I'm not too sure if it is the same question I'm asking. Is that the same question as how literate are we? Trinidad and Tobago. He was a reading facilitator, so. <laughs> I think that's a different type of question. <laughs> that's a different type of question. And you would want to answer that sometime, sometime yes. ago, from yes. now. Yeah? yeah. Not, not but, a problem. But I think that yeah. in terms of functional literacy, um, we are 90% in that people could do basic reading, or, or above 90%, 99%. But in terms of um, competence uh, to engage in social media and things like that, um, we need everybody to be on board. Okay, I won't ask Dr. Smith any more hard questions. But but I, I want to turn to uh, to Dr. Alain, who would have presented early on system goals and philosophy. And you did raise quite a, a number of issues about, you know, um, the goals that we should have. In uh, You named equity and excellence and so on. And you talked about development of character. Um uh, more specifically, ethics, integrity, morality. Are these important, though, 
or how important are they in education? For us in Trinidad and Tobago, how important are they? It's for us to determine how important we consider them to be. Because what gets, you know, assessed gets taught. And if we examine the examinations that we have and that we put our children through as standardized tests, if these things are not being assessed in some form, then there has to be some other conduit through which we can determine whether or not they are in fact um, integrated into the curriculum so that they are assimilated and that they, um, at the end of the day, can have an impact on the kind of citizen we produce. Um, if we don't consider them to be important enough to put them into the system in such a way that they are uh, a part of the learning experiences the children have and that they could shape the character of the children and that they could shape the young people and shape the citizens that we produce, then perhaps what we get at the end of the day is a product that we have serious concerns about and that we have a lot of problems with. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arlene. And a follow-up question to that, but th we will answer that afterwards, is how important is education in Trinidad and Tobago? Is it necessary? That's an, a question that perhaps maybe one of you can take, but first we do have a live Zoomer. Uh, Mrs. Charlene Kwamina uh, is live on Zoom. Welcome, uh, Charlene Kwamina. You have a question, a comment? Okay, we seem to be having some difficulty there. Okay, so we, uh, Michelle Young, we have Michelle Young on Zoom. Nice to have you, Michelle. Welcome. We're still working out the kinks in that, and Michelle can come in at any point in time. But the question that I've asked is education important, and and that you know you get the impression sometimes that education is not as valued um sometimes you you've you've heard i'm sure you've heard that children go to school not necessarily parents send children to school not necessarily for education but because it's a holding bay you know it allows them for them to to go and and do whatever they need to do go to work and so on is it value do you from where you sit do you see education being valued or given the kind of attention that it deserves? Well, I mean, I would like to comment on that quite briefly. Um, I think we need to reflect a little more on how much we see education. Our forefathers, um, the first time minister talked about, you know, education, uh, the nation being carried in the book bags of the kids. Um, but it's probably more than that. When you look at other societies, you do realize that they feel that their very economic futures are dependent upon the quality of education. I think, therefore, there's a need to kind of a shift towards that. I think quickly about a, a country like Singapore, um, they don't have resources, and so they feel that they need to invest in the, the human capital. Um, so it's for economic reasons. They're not trying to to be the best because they want to be the best. They try to be the best because they're afraid of the future. Hong Kong is another interesting um, country. Even if you're living in you know, a one-room place, uh, you, you're making sure that your students um, do very well. And when you look at their graph, you find that students, uh, um, families who are economically deprived, the students are, are, are doing quite well. So we need to value education a little bit more but we will get there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. You want to add anything, Dr. Smith? And I think generally, um, citizenry does see education as being important. I think the challenge that we may face um, would be the level of involvement that needs to take place to really realize that goal of education. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith. We do have a question from Zoom. It's a very interesting one. I was wondering when would this come? <laughs> well, it has arrived. Yeah. Since 1998, according to the Zoomer, 
these consultations and proposed changes or elimination or elimination, I pose, of SEA have been discussed. However, SEA remains a revamped common entrance exam. What is the true timeline that can be forecast for the removal of SEA and the, the implementation of a continuous assessment strategy for the seamless progression from elementary to secondary schools? A very long question, but basically the person is asking, when are we going to do away with SEA? Yeah. Well, you see, they ask some questions, but they also give an answer that is continuous assessment. And, and there was a period in which we tried continuous assessment and, and, and that needed to be evaluated, but I was certainly always willing to help both the ministry and uh, the political parties involved. And I, I don't know if you had the, the kind of results that, um, I don't know if continuous assessment for high stakes placement is necessarily the way to go. What we've tried to explain is that the problem does not lie only, absolutely, in whether you have an SE or not. Because by saying that the Netherlands will have a CETA 12, and by saying that Singapore has the PSLE, we are saying that there are other countries and they're doing quite well. But there are problems, and the problems relate, just as the 1998 committee saw, with the, the variance in the schools. So once you could reduce that variance, um, and we probably will give a time frame for that, you, you can do anything that you want. But you can't just look at a system in which you have that degree of difference and then say, oh yes, I'm going to break some China now. Um, you have to bring it together. All right. Um, we want to remind you that we do have Philip Rochford, Mr. Philip Rochford, um, in Tobago, and he's joined us uh, by, live via Zoom. He's the uh, school supervisor to acting. And uh, we do have a question here for him, Mr. Philip Rochford. How can the terms in the Concordat be phased out? to create a more equitable school system. And this, of course, is in line with your presentation on the policy trajectory of the SE and Concordat. And as a matter of fact, it ties in with a question that I would have um, had for you. How relevant is a question you ask yourself? And um, having been able to go through the Concordat um, throughout the years, uh, do you see it as still relevant today? But that's my question. The question that Zuma asks is, how can the terms in the Concordat be phased out to create a more equitable school system? Mr. Rochford. Thank you, Lance. Um, I would want to suggest that um, we need to look at the particular terms, um, but we have to look at it in the context of all the other things that would have happened, particularly with the most recent um, being the Ventor judgment. Um, the Concordat, which originally was an agreement, um, and it still is an agreement between the government and the denominational boards, um, but has now been placed, you know, as, as, as a legal, our legal experts would have shared with us, um, as a fundamental right almost. Um, because of the judgment. Um, and until that judgment is appealed, if it ever is, um, when we are examining the Concordat, we need to we need to look at it from the context of really rene renegotiating it. Um, and we need to do that um, with transparency, um, in good faith, and getting everybody on board. But um, I think, from the cries of the public and, and, and from the, 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 the uh, examination of the previous uh, data, there is really need to, um, to re-examine that agreement. Thank you, Mr. Rochford. And we do have a question for Dr. Alain. What strategies can we use to get as many people as possible on the same page about what it means to have high quality education? That's an interesting one in terms of strategy. Um, but one of the things that many persons have been advocating for for a number of years is a quality assurance and quality improvement system at the secondary 
and the primary levels as well. Um, many persons would have realized that over the years we developed a very strong, I'd like to say a very robust quality assurance system in Trinidad and Tobago at the tertiary level and at the post-secondary level. So the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago plays a very important role in terms of the accreditation of post-secondary institutions. Um, but in many countries in the world, there are quality assurance systems which focus on school improvement, um, but also on monitoring school performance um, at the primary and secondary levels. And we have, uh, I have been one of those persons advocating for that for a number of years. Um, that will address something that Dr. Delisle spoke about a while ago in terms of that variation um, in terms of quality between schools where we have first choice schools and, and, cho and I like to call them no choice schools because they're schools that people would not want to choose um, for specific reasons. But that quality assurance system will in fact level the playing field over time so that we could target school improvement where it needs to be improved and we can ensure that all schools offer similar opportunities or comparable opportunities to students who would um, go there. Another question for you, uh, Dr. Allen, so don't take off your mic. Uh, since our goal is a high achievement model, we need to look closely and especially at content, expectations and support. How or in what ways can we address the disparities if we are to be successful? at a high achievement. Huh. Again, again, please, yeah. Yeah, so, I I got a um, lost in it. so th this Zuma is, is, is saying that since our goal is high achievement, mm. um, we need to look at the content mm -hmm. and uh, the expectations and support. I'm not too sure of what, mm -hmm. but um, how can we address the disparities? You would have named right. some disparities right. in your presentation. Yeah. How can we address those disparities if we are to you know, achieve yeah. high achievement? So I would assume that the person is talking about all of the things that would go into the curriculum as well as the support for learning um, in schools and school environments. And again, if you implement a system of quality assurance at the national level, then there will be criteria that all schools will have to meet. Um, and in terms of meeting those criteria, there will be a requirement for resources to be provided to all schools so that then you find that the current disparity over time will be eliminated because access to resources would have to be made for all schools. And you will have a system for monitoring that in fact they are meeting common criteria. We won't be able to get rid of all of the disparities at once. It's a, it's a not, gradual process. Not at once. It's a process. The same has happened with the tertiary education sector over time. And it's a process of improvement and a process where the quality assurance mechanism provides support for the institutions. But at least you know what you're targeting. You know what the standard is. You know what you have to do to meet that standard and you get support in terms of put, putting what you need to put in place. And it's also a multi-system approach. Um, uh, it involves um, other aspects of government, Ministry of Social Development, um, uh, you would say? Yes, to the extent that there are students who certainly come out of situations where they require additional support. And I know that the Ministry of Education has been um, doing a lot of work in that regard in terms of providing support for students who come out of challenge situations and challenge backgrounds and in terms of those who have also the need for special education or for some kind of remediation you know we talk about compensatory um, education and i mean i understand that um would you say that and th this is not for you um dr ali this is a, mm -hmm. you know either professor delisle or dr peter smith can take this given our social network um, in Trinidad and Tobago, where we have free education, we have um, books provided to our students, well, to some extent, um, and some other so social services uh, for our students. Would you say that we do have some level of compensatory education in Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah. Well, I mean, I know Dr. Smith will want to also answer that. It's not targeted. And uh, compensatory education is not just uh, providing books or money as we used to do um, when I was a teacher um, to everybody. It's, it's a matter of um, 
helping the schools that service these communities to making sure that you have teacher training, you have resources, um, and you have the leadership that will drive these, help these schools turn around, Dr. Sman? To add, perhaps what we are trying to do is to target those who are most vulnerable. Yeah. Okay. We have a Facebook question. Are there any plans for a seamless, non-examinable system for the transmission of primary to secondary education? If so, what are the barriers towards implementing this and how do we circumvent these? Yeah, well, that's an, it's, it's, it's the same question. As long as you have differences, as Dr. Allen said, you're going to have uh, people making choices. And how do you make choices for persons when legally, as, as, as Mr. Rushford um, has indicated in terms of our excellent legal advice from, from elsewhere, that you can't um, force persons to make those choices. So what you have to do is to bring, help bring the system together. Uh, make sure that schools are schools that people can choose. And it's not difficult. Um, we were trying to suggest that even the modern secondaries, the government has to understand, look, this is a quasi-market system, which is basically, once you have choice, you have a quasi-market system. So people could choose. Then you have to make sure that your schools are schools of choice as well. And here is a, a Zoom question, a technical one, technical because it speaks to how students are placed. Um, to what extent is the principle of equity observed if there are students who do not get their first choice while others with the same or lower marks secure theirs? Very interesting. Can you repeat it? Please? <laughs> I know this question would have come as well, you know. Um, it's a question, it's a very popular question. Um, the person is asking, if we're talking about equity, we're talking about equity, but in their minds, there are some students who do not get their first choices at all, but there are others who have the same mark or a lower mark, and they are placed in their first choice. I think that needs some explanation on how students are placed okay so there are approximately i think i believe about six criteria that we use for the placement of students it's not just simply one of marks um, merit is a, a key one but we also have residence we have if they have multiple births and so on so it, it's different criteria used for placement as the case may be um and that being said of course once you have that choice or those elements, you are going to see some differences going forward. And let me just state also, um, our concept of a, a first choice is grounded in certain schools that we label as prestigious. But really, it is the parents who make that decision in terms of what schools they do put. And as we have seen, in some schools, we are seeing parents now beginning to make a conscious decision to place ex school as a first choice, to use that term. And as long as parents continue to make those choices, um, it's then we will see the differences that we, we desire to see. Now, that is an issue that the committee would have deliberated on, I, I know. And yeah. uh, so that, um, let me ask you, Dr. Lyle, are there plans by the committee to address this particular concern? All right. So let me let me answer that because I, I tend not to answer that because I've seen some um, articles and papers between people who are very um, qualified talking about merit. The OECD, from all the analyses of all their piece of data, is suggesting that at 11, 10 to 12, you cannot measure merit with achievement tests. You will always get family background. And that's why we were hinting to you that when you see the stratification of schools, you're not seeing ability. What you're really seeing is SES, maybe ability somewhere I mix up, plus opportunities to learn. All right, um, people from the rural area are not slower than people from the urban area, but the urban areas do better. 
So, so, so people want to be able, just as our colonial forefathers did, they want to be able to measure ability and say, you see, you, you will be a brain surgeon. That cannot happen at 11. Once you understand that technical aspect, you'll understand why a number of countries are, are moving towards delaying, delaying tracking. Um, and of course, it'll include some Caribbean countries in, in, in the meantime. That also kind of puts a, 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 a tinge on the on the concordat itself because or or the twenty percent um, yeah. because it's simply another way of moving forward. So, so there are some little technical aspects that maybe we could discuss in the next consultations. Um, but the SCA, and I'm measurement, I'm a pure measurement person, does not measure um, ability. And we have local studies which actually show that by Corinne Luizel. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Delisle. Well, we are getting closer and closer to the end of the program. But before that, we must take a quick break. And when we come back, we will have uh, our final and closing remarks. We take a break at this time. Mommy, yes? I'm scared. It's okay. Just keep your mask on and wash your hands as often as possible. Uh -huh. Remember how we practice? Mm -hmm. It will be fun to be back in school. You learn about healthy eating habits, play games to stay fit, mm -hmm. and you can even get a nutritious breakfast and lunch at lunchtime. And we'll see you later when we meet with the school nurse to discuss healthy eating options. The Ministry of Education is doing its part. Let's get our children back to school safely. Welcome back. I think we can all agree that today has been a very informative, very exciting, and has given the nation a lot of food for thought. Today we covered topics that allowed you to see into the committee's review process, including the history and impact of education policies in Trinidad and Tobago, various sources of data and how it was analyzed, and critical system level data on our education system as it pertains to the SEA transition into secondary schools, the committee's job is not easy. The topic of the SCA and Concordat are complex and require sensitive, insightful, and innovative approaches to ensure the best policy decisions possible for the improvement of our education system. We hope to see you again next week, Tuesday, June 4th, 14th at 6 p.m. when our discussion will focus on the partnerships because change transformation requires all of us working together guests will include additional members of the committee to present on topics including the role of parents in achieving system change that's by uh, Ms. Zina Ramatali the role of school leaders in ensuring sustainable change at the school level by Ms. Shara Carrington James the role of teachers in moving an education system forward Ms. Ant Antonia Dictica de Fritas, a union's voice by Marlon Seals, denominational boards as partners, Ms. Sharon Mangru, Mr. Ali, and, uh, and Abdul Mohan, denominational schools in the system, Ms. Mahes, Ms. Mah Mr. Maharaj, a glimpse at policy options, Ms. Professor Jerome Delisle. You can continue the conversation with us through our email at seaconsultation at moe.gov.tt and of course at WhatsApp. It would be remiss of me if we have brought the end of this consultation tonight without saying thank you to some key persons. And there are quite a lot, but I'm just going to mention uh, some broad names. We want to say thanks to uh, the UE School of Education, the personnel um, there. 
We want to say thank you to them. We want to say thanks to the UE Marketing as well. A special thanks to the MOE Communications Department and the MOE CEO's office. We also want to say thanks to our service provider, soundpro.com. Thank you very much. And of course, we also want to say a special thank you to our sign language team, Dr. Paulson Skerritt and Ms. Eka McPhee. A special thanks to our panelists this evening, Professor Jerome Delisle, Dr. Peter Smith, Dr. Alain, who is here with us, and Dr. Um, Dr. Spence, who would have been with us uh, earlier today, earlier this evening, and of course, joining us live on Zoom, Mr. Philip Rochford. Thank you to all of our participants on Facebook, on Zoom, on WhatsApp. We really appreciate your presence and the questions that you have asked. We do look forward to seeing you again next week, Tuesday, and a whole lot more of you. My name is Lance Motley. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Good evening and good night.